welcome to the beautiful setting of the Three Counties showground nestled in the Malvern Hills. On this month's Around the Dog World, we feature just two groups at National Working and Pastoral Breeds. Here in Malvern at the Dual Group Show, we'll watch Terry Munro judge each of the groups and his group winners will go head to head, one on one in the best in show ring. For the two groups on show this weekend, today's prize is one of the most coveted in the sport. But first, we need to take stock and look at the recent best in show winners. I'm all alone in Malvern this weekend, but not to worry, there's little we haven't said about champion Travella Striking Steel. Oliver the Wire Fox Terrier won his 14th all breeds best in show at East of England. Already heading the top dog table, this extends his lead, but a few others in the chasing pack also featured on the prize card. Taking group wins were Jen the German Spitz and Norwegian Elkhound Pearl. Two of the Windsor group winners we watched last month, Alaskan Malamute Bart and Akita Will I Am, jump up to sixth and seventh. Re-entering the table in eighth after a group win at East of England is Bo Mastiff Mac. And rounding out the top ten is Japanese Chin Damage and Long Coat Chihuahua Holly Hill Topaz Chancer. And that of course brings us here to Malvern. But before we head into the best in show ring tonight, I caught up with Stuart Mallard earlier on, who gave us a bit of an insight into the breeds on show in the working and pastoral groups. So Stuart, you originally were involved in Old English Sheepdogs. Tell us a bit more about the, the two groups that are on show today. The two groups that, were on show, that are on show today were one group. Right, okay. And people my age, of my generation, in, to some, some degree will always think of it as the working group. Right. The Kennel Club are quite right to change it. So you've got mainly herding breeds, right. Old English, blah, blah, blah that go into the partial group, then they've got our dogs mainly, which have become the working group. But they're all functional, yeah. totally functional. So now we have an idea of the breeds on show today, we need to pick a few to take a look at in a bit more detail. First of all is the St Bernard, a breed that suffered bad publicity of late. We went to the home of Chandlermoor St Bernards and spoke to Tan Gretchen. Thank you very much, Tan, for letting us drop in and meet some of your beautiful St Bernard's. You're most welcome, Simon. Now, they, they are one of the world's most recognisable breeds uh, for size, for their nature. They're depicted on snow-capped mountains with the brandy barrel rescuing. Um, and, of course, on the silver screen. Take us over a St Bernard's appearance. Well, it's a majestic dog. It's a big dog. It's a dog that should have size, certainly have substance. It is cuddly. And people who like giant breeds always fall in love with the St Bernard. The key thing for the breed is temperament. Uh, the word I use is trustworthy. They are a breed that are very loyal and very trustworthy. So it's the perfect combination, really. Where are the origins of the breed? The breed originated at the hospice, the St Bernard Hospice. 980 AD, I believe, uh, St Augustine started this hospice between the only pass that runs between Switzerland and Italy. Wow and evidence shows that the breed originated uh, in 1660s, but they say that the dogs existed for at least 700 years prior. The St Bernards did have this ability to, to almost predict avalanches, blizzard conditions coming, and there were lots of travelers who used to get lost in these uh, blizzards in this mountainous terrain, and the monks used to shelter them and rescue them. I mean, they even trained the dogs to actually go out in packs where they found these lost travellers. A couple of the dogs would stay with the travellers to give them warmth and comfort, while a couple of the dogs would return <laughs> to the hospice. Wow. And when the weather cleared, they would lead the monks back to the lost travellers. <laughs> and there was a very famous St Bernard called Barry that in his lifetime rescued uh, over 40 lost travellers wow. from uh, certain death. And that justifies the, the trustworthiness. Absolutely. You know, you don't want a St Bernard that finds you and then eats you alive. So <laughs> trust is a very big thing for a giant breed like ours. And they've, they've certainly served you well. Is it 15 years consecutively breeder of the year? Yeah, 15 years. But the, the key thing is, when I first took on the breed, I love the breed for the size. I love the breed for their temperaments. But I really wasn't always comfortable with what I actually saw in the show ring. And what I saw in the show ring were great big dogs which were quite heavy set, lumbering, and not particularly active, shall I say. 
And if you go back to the origins of the breed, they must be athletic, yeah. but athletic without losing their substance and size. Yeah. So the motto I kind of took on was, get the bodies right, you can always add the pretty bits on later. However, in more recent times, they have had a bit of a rough going. Yeah. Um, they're one of the breeds on the Kennel Club's high profile list. How was that received? Well, I think all when it first came out, uh, all the 15 high profile breed enthusiasts must have felt a level of confusion, really. And I think that the key thing is for us to be positive and look in the right direction. Try and uh, recognise what, what is required to actually guess off the uh, high profile breed. What I will say is uh, uh, the people in the know should recognise that there has been a marked improvement in many points which the breed, uh, breed Watch talks about. That has to be considered as a huge positive step. Of course, eyes are an issue for all brachycephalic breeds. The, the, the thing is, head breeds will always tend to have a level of exaggeration that is not easy to get rid of because it's not a perfect science. However, they are a wonderful breed. Um, there are many, many people that will want them as pets because they are so appealing. I'm one of them. Is there any advice you would give to owners that, that would like one of these huge, friendly breeds? The key thing to consider is size. They're not going to curl up under your coffee table and disappear. They make great draft excluders. However, <laughs> if they're sat behind a doe, it is not impossible to move them <laughs> if they choose not to get up. Very friendly, very trustworthy. They make fabulous family pets. They don't need huge amount of exercise. However, they can cope with a lot of exercise. Uh, they do drop hair, so if you're extremely house proud, hair is something that you've got to consider. It isn't true that they slobber to the degree that it is depicted sometimes, but there is an element of slobber. Uh, rearing them is key. A St. Bernard is born and sits on the palm of my hand. <laughs> At eight, 10 weeks is about 15, 20 kilos. So it's about that big, six months, eight months, you know, and by 12 months, it's reached its maximum height. It's taken us 16 years to get to our height. It's taken us in Bernard a year. The key is to get it there nice and steadily and slowly. So good feeding is very, very key. Again, read quite interestingly how you were brought up in India. I was. You yeah. snuck dogs into your apartment and hit oh, them. Oh, gosh, you're not going to ask me about that, are you? Explain a bit further. Well, I was born and brought up in India, and I was quite always fascinated with animals. Uh, but we lived in an apartment, so I used to go into the slums to rescue little puppies and little kittens and come and hide them in, uh, in my bedroom. And of course, eventually, my mother would find them. <laughs> so the next day when I went to school, she would pick him up and take him back into the slums, and eventually they let me keep a cat. <laughs> um, unfortunately, she had lots of kittens because I was very young and I didn't realise what was required to do. Uh, and then I managed to buy a little book on the breed standards, which just had a page on every breed. Uh, and I must have read that a million times. And the Cairn Terrier was one that I was very fascinated with. Not that I've ever owned a Cairn. And you I'm have ne owned Norwich and Norfolk. Yeah, I've, I've had Norwich and Norfolk Terriers in the past. And uh, the Norwich Terriers, the breed, I really, truly love. Well, thank you very much for letting us come in, Tan. Um, You're welcome. And we'll see you throughout the year. Thank you. Next up, we'll stay in the working group and take a closer look at a breed that epitomises the family dog. Earlier today, I spoke to Tim Hutchings about the Boxer. Well, I'm now speaking to owner of the Winnowak kennel name and uh, had a rather successful day in the Boxer ring, winning a first CC. Congratulations. Right, thank you. Now, tell us a bit about the breed. How did you first get involved? Uh, I first got involved in the breed it was a strange story in a way in that my mum and dad have never ever wanted a dog at all uh, and of course I always did but no matter how much I asked there was no way that was going to happen and so cycling to uh, the school I was at at the time and the route used to take me past a little cream coloured bungalow uh, and the cream coloured bungalow was owned by Marion and Ivor Ward Davis who clearly right. had the yes. had the Winnowood Kennel Lane since 1952 I think they founded it and just started helping out and it kind of went from there. And that, yeah, I know we all fall in love with the breeds that we own, 
but you know, from a boxer point of view, they're the archetypal family dog. Yeah. You know, they are so adaptable. What I always say to people is they're just always up for everything. Really are full of energy. And I, I love about a boxer is they really do have a comparatively short old age. You've got a boxer that's 10 years old and it's still acting like a two-year-old. <laughs> uh, they, they really are just fantastic. And after all, Di Johnson at her audience with did say all the best people in boxers. Ah, indeed, indeed, <laughs> and indeed, Di did herself. Exactly. Always says it's her favourite breed. And you I'm, can't I'm argue with sure can't argue with Di. No. Um, so tell us a bit more about the the temperament of the breed. The history of the boxer was they are a they are a guarding breed in the original standard it talks about being distrustful of strangers and I mean really they should be but the point about a boxer is that when they've got to know you and they know that you're a friend they are just the most giving and playful dogs you could imagine but they know that their family are the special ones right <laughs> and if they're introduced to somebody else they'll be quite happy and they'll be outgoing as long as their masters approve if you like but actually there's sort of something quite nice about a dog that you own if if you feel like you're extra special and of course they do have this really playful nature so they are popular as pets yes is there advice that you give based on a boxer to potential pet owners what, look, what we always say around the boxer is you need to be number one in the household yeah because if you're not what you'll find is and it's true of a lot of these uh, the, 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 the guarding working breeds is you find the dog ultimately becomes a bit dominant right. so they've got to know their limits and as long as they do as long as you're firm fair but kind they'll give you years and years of enjoyment Good morning everybody. This is the third edition of A Stockman's Eye. Um, this time we're being filmed, so possibly it might be my last. <laughs> now when they're made reasonably well and trained physically like you would a gymnast, which is really all that dressage is, you end up with something that stays sound for a very great deal longer. So said she would catch some people out too, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> She's a good girl, you are. She says, I know you love me, Auntie Patricia. Good old Buzz. Trick trot, trick trot. You can see that with the butcher's cart on the back, can't you? You know, what a fabulous walk. Ultimately, I, mean, I know people talk about boxers being a working breed. It's actually quite hard to work out what, what job boxers originally were bred to do. Right. They were the result of mating an old English bulldog called right. Tom the Bulldog uh, to a French bull mastiff type bitch. Uh, and that resulted in the first boxer in 1895. Uh, and since then, they, because of their adaptable nature, they've been used for very many different things. And when judging, a lot of attention is paid to a boxer's head. Yeah. Tell us about what, what the, the archetypal head should look like. Okay, I'm glad you asked me that question because <laughs> the reality is the boxer isn't a head breed. If you look at what's asked for under the breed standard, it talks about looking at the general appearance first and you know, that overall view you get from yeah. across the ring. You then come down, and it does say in there special attention should be given to the head. You know, people then get a bit fixated on it, so I think we've just got to keep that, that thing in balance. Is the head important? Of course it is. Are they a head breed? I'd always argue they're not. Now, when you're looking at a boxer head, what you want to see is you want to see that lovely balance between muzzle and skull. And you also want to see a lovely, lo it makes a big difference on a boxer head, you want a very obvious stop and you want a lovely rise of skull, so up between the eyes you want that to be a decent rise of skull. Ultimately, the boxer head should be very clean. It should have lovely, lovely clean cheeks. And it should have wrinkle on the head, but the wrinkle should only arise when the dog's alert. Right. But again, back to it, don't, let's not obsess about the head. It's one part of the breed. You can't kick a good head around the ring. The soundness of body, uh, the soundness of movement in a working dog is so important. And you say about soundness there, what do you expect overall in a boxer? The boxer is a medium-sized square breed of dog. Those are some of the first words in the standard and you want balanced angulation of front and back. If you kind of ignore the head completely, they're actually a very straightforward breed of dog to judge. Yeah. 
Um, and I remember a while ago speaking to Andrew Brace, yep. um, who was a big fan of one of Winnerwick's most successful dogs of all time, Max, yeah. an incredible 74, 74, 74 cc's. What made him such a good example? I mean, back to what I was saying earlier, this whole idea of medium size and square, Max was a medium size square boxer, absolutely full of breed type, a totally typical head, eyes that kind of spoke to you. But if we're being absolutely honest, the reality about that dog is he just had, between his ears, <laughs> he had show personality. You took Max into the big ring, he just went up a notch. Yeah. He just loved it. He was made to show. And you see, when he went into the big ring, he just yeah. wanted to show. A couple of crafts yeah. group wins is, is phenomenal. Indeed. T tell us what else he's, he's won. Well, he's the top winning boxer of all time. A couple of all breed best in shows. 21 group wins, which we're really proud of. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of done it all. And I mean, almost even as important as that, is he was the top boxer sire last year, he's the top boxer sire this year. You know, his son was best of breed at Crufts this year for us. And now this year, we've won the Dog CC with a very young dog who is a grandson of Max's. And, Fantastic. you know, so the cycle goes on. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. No worries. Um, and best of luck for your, the dog that won our first CC today. That's Hope great. we see him in the group ring a little, a little late. We will do. Cheers, thank Simon. You. Thank you. Now, as we're focused on the working breeds, let's find out who will top today's group. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Terry Munro. We're now ready to see the dogs in the working group, the Alaskan Malamu number 22. The Bernese Mountain Dog. The breed today was judged by Tom Kelly. The Bernese Mountain Dog, number 159. The Bouvier de Flanders, number 176. The breed today was judged by Tracy Hill. The Boxer, number 201. The Bull Mastiff, number 338. The Canadian Eskimo Dog, number 374. The Doberman, judged by Margaret Spingley. The Doberman, number 384. And now it's the turn of the Dog de Bordeaux. The Dog de Bordeaux, number 510. Another breed today for Rodney Oldham. The German Pinscher, number 535. And now it's the turn of the Giant Schnauzer. The Giant Schnauzer, number 561. Mr. Monroe is now looking at the Great Dane, judged by Sandy Lippmann. The Great Dane, number 608. The Leonberger. The breed today was judged by Maggie Bryant. The Leonberger, number 689. The breed today was judged by Gina Taylor. The Mastiff, number 733. Terry is now continuing with the Newfoundland. The Newfoundland, number 760. Now it's the turn of the Portuguese Water Dog. The Portuguese Water Dog, number 832. The Rottweiler. The breed today was judged by Esther Shaves. The Rottweiler, number 936. Mr. Monroe is now looking at the Russian Black Terrier. The breed today was judged by Alan Mees. The St. Bernard. There were 33 dogs entered today. The St. Bernard, number 975. The Siberian Husky. The Siberian Husky, number 1055. The Tibetan Mastiff, number 1101. And so we come to the last dog in this, the working group, the Greenland dog, number 659. Mr. Monroe now having a final 
look before deciding on his shortlist. In comes the Alaskan Malamute, the Bouvier, the Boxer, the Bull Mastiff, the Doberman, the Dog de Bordeaux, the Newfoundland, and also the Portuguese Water Dog. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Munro is going to move each of the shortlisted dogs again, and it's the turn of the Alaskan Malamute number 22. And now it's the turn of the Bouvier de Founders number 176. The Boxer number 201. The Bullmastiff, number 338. The Doberman, number 384. The Dog de Bordeaux, number 510. The Newfoundland, number 760. And finally, the Portuguese Water Dog, number 832. The boards have been called for. We should shortly know the winners of this, the working group. The winner of the working group, National Working and Pastoral Breeds 2014, is the Bull Mastiff. Into group two goes the Alaskan Malamute, number 22. Group three, the Portuguese Water Dog. And group four, the Dog de Bordeaux, number 510. The winners of the working group, the Blue Mastiff, the Alaskan Malamute, the Portuguese Water Dog, and the Dog de Bordeaux. Well, congratulations, Peter. It looks like around the dog world is uh, Max Lucky Charm, isesn't it? Yes, it certainly is. Um, that's his fourth group he's had this year, and Dog World have been here for the three of them. I think he likes the TV cameras. <laughs> Boston, followed by Welks, East of England last week, and now here. He's on a bit of form. He is, yeah. Early on, uh, we were really pleased with him, and he just seems to be going from strength to strength. He's an import from Norway. We flew over when he was ten weeks old and just fell in love with him. Um, he came over when he was six months. Um, and we've had a great time with him. We've had 18 tickets, all with best of breed, four group ones now. Um, he just seems to like the big ring. And he's not even particularly old yet? No, he was uh, just three last week, so he's still got at least a couple of years, hopefully, of showing at the top level. Last time you were on the programme, you spoke about his breeder from Norway. She was lucky enough to be over last week to watch him win the group. Yeah, she flew over just especially for, for the two shows. There was two shows last weekend. It's just a great honour for her to be there and for the dog to do so well. And it was a very hot day today. Did Max struggle at all? No, he, he doesn't seem to, to be affected by the heat. He, he's got a natural fitness. It's a fitness I haven't really witnessed before. He just seems to have this natural energy. And he just never seems to tire. <laughs> he never, never lets me down and he just goes all day. And now we turn our attention to the other half of the breeds on show today in the pastoral group. The first herding breed for us to examine is the Samoyed. Over the past 12 months, we've seen a couple of Samoyeds winning best in shows at all breed championship shows, one of which belongs to this lady here, Val Freer. Thank you very much for joining us, Val. Thank you. Dan's now a multiple best in show winner, yeah. Crafts Reserve best in show winner. How have those sort of months and, and year been? Uh, pretty amazing. I mean, <laughs> still, we relive those times from Crufts. I yeah. mean, from him winning the group and 
on the final day to reserve Best in Show. I mean, it's been just amazing, and, and still we're getting congratulations. I saw you at the City of Birmingham in tears. I mean, when it was Best. Oh show. yes, oh yes. I can't imagine what you were like. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, that was one special day to have got our first Best in Show mm. with a samoy that I bred. Shimmering coat, smiling face. There's no doubt why the breed appealed to you in the first place. Ah, oh, well, yes. I mean, gosh, I've had samoys now for 38 years, so they've always been very special, and they're absolutely super with children. Roll about the floor with them, <laughs> no problems at all. And they do have very cheerful temperaments, and a beautifully cheerful face. Isn't yeah, that? that Sammy um, smile. A samoyed adult is is cute enough, but a puppy. Oh. Just, oh. Well, yeah, <laughs> heart melting, absolutely yeah, heart yeah. melting. Lovely bundles of fluff, but obviously <laughs> those bundles of fluff grow into a full-size dog that needs a lot of exercise and yeah. a lot of work on that coat. Take us back to the history of the breed. How did the breed come about? Well, originally from Siberia, they were used as uh, reindeer herders. Right. Then later they did use them for sleds, for pulling, and to live with the close family from the Samoyed people. They used to live in their tombs um, on the bottom of the bed, <laughs> and they still do that. <laughs> they still <laughs> like to sleep on the bottom of your bed, yeah. And of, of course, you've had fantastic success in the show ring, but what about outside of the show ring? Are they used for working purposes as well? Absolutely, yes. There's a lot of people that do work the Samoys right. in harness. A lot of people exercise them on bikes because at the end of the day they're a working dog yeah. and they need to be kept fit and they do love it, yeah. And in the show ring with their glistening coat, they, they are a very appealing dog in the ring. Yeah. But they also appeal to people outside of the show ring just because of that, that yeah, temperature. Yeah, exactly. Make great pets. Absolutely wonderful pets, yes. I mean, like I say, providing you're willing to putting the time to exercise them and to keep their coat in condition because, you know, without grooming, it, the coats do get matted. But no, I mean, they, they are really superb pets and very loyal, good companion dogs, yeah. And what about someone looking for, for a puppy? What advice would you, you give them before, before picking a sandwich? Before picking a sandwich? Well, obviously, I suppose breed clubs are the first place to, to go to. Mm. If, go to the secretaries of breed clubs. They normally know where there's puppies available from right. reputable breeders. The breeders will give them all the help they can. And throughout the past year, Dan was picking up fans by the barrel. Oh yes, Dan the man, yeah. Dan the man. <laughs> and we haven't seen a great deal of him this year. What are his plans? And, and no, he did come out after Crofts. He went to a, a breed club champ show and was best in show there. Uh, then we pulled him out. He had a bit of a rest. Um, in the meantime, his son, Harley, he's been made a champion, so okay. it's nice for him. And now there's another litter. I've got a young puppy that's coming out, so it's nice to see his progeny come through yeah, and, and follow on. You've always got to look forward to the next level. The last breed that we take a look at today is one popular not just in the show ring, but also for agility, fly ball, sheepdog trials, and of course, as a pet. It is the Border Collie. Well, thank you, Judith, and, and of course, Rhodey, for joining us. <laughs> and now, let's get straight to it. Why Border Collies? Well, um, I think when I was 15, I used to go to a dog training class with a little Jack Russell. And somebody came along with a Border Collie, and I instantly fell in love with it. <laughs> And she said to me, oh, you can have him and pay me with your pocket money. <laughs> Which took a long time to pay for him, but of there course, you go. <laughs> yeah. um, and you've had a great deal of success in the breeds. You've been a breeder of the year eight times, is it? Uh, I think ten years now. Wow. With, and also we've, we've won the breeder stakes at Crufts twice with That's the team. That's phenomenal. So clearly your, your involvement with the breed, starting at 15, runs, runs very deep. And now um, I'm 74. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we should look back at the, the history of the breed. Uh -huh. How exactly did, was the breed developed? Well, um, obviously it's a herding dog. Mm. And the word uh, collie comes from coley, which means a useful dog. Right, okay. And it was bred on the borders yeah. between Scotland and England, particularly. 
and bred as a working dog to herd sheep and cattle, etc. Right. Is it fair to say there's quite a difference between breeders of working and breeders of showing border collies? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Um, I mean, the farmers, the farmers and the sheepdog trialers are breeding dogs to work and they don't particularly worry about what they look like. Whereas show border collies, they're looking for the same construction and the same movement, but it does have to have that economy and stealthy gait, right. which you can lose. You can lose it quite easily in the show dogs. But now border collies are the only breed in the herding group that have to pass a herding test in order to become a full champion. Right, okay. Wow. Otherwise, they're just a show champion. We only have one in the breed at the moment. Yes. And it is a great ambition of mine to have a full, a full champion. champion. And I have got a bitch at the moment that's very strong working instinct. And she's only 14 months, but right. I think I might try <laughs> and get her she's the one. trained. <laughs> yes, she's the one for me. <laughs> um, and with that in mind, Border Collies um, on the, the intelligence test yes. came out top of all breeds. Absolutely. Um, does that mean they need different stimulus? They need a lot of stimulus and they need consistent stimulus and the people who are handling them have to have really good timing. And it's the same in the show ring, to train obedience, to train agility, to train flyball, to train sheepdog trials. It's the timing and the consistency and you have to be the leader of the pack. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about the characteristics. Intelligence is clearly one. How else would you describe a border collie? Uh, I'd say they're very sensitive. They're not for everybody. They're constantly listening. You can see him constantly listening and looking. And they're very loyal. They love to be with you. Anything you want to do, they'll do it with you. They're sometimes a one-person dog. Right. Because I'm not so agile as I was, <laughs> <laughs> I have to have a team of handlers for me. I must say, my dogs will go with most people now, but they have to get a bond with the dog. They, they're herding dogs, they're working breeds, so mm. that suggests they need an awful lot of exercise as well. They do. I mean, there are dogs that if you give them a 20-minute walk twice a day and you give them things to do in the garden or you keep them motivated, then they're quite happy to come in and lie down. Every dog's different, really. I mean, he's quite a laid-back sort of dog, yes. But I've got others that would be on the go all the time. They have to go to active people. Um, yeah. So that's another thing. Pet owners, mm -hmm. what advice do you give them when they, they come and ask for, for one like one man and his dog? Right. Well, either give them the book. This is your <laughs> which, book here. Yes, this is my book, which is extremely good. Different people have written different chapters. And there's a whole chapter in there on what to do when you get your puppy and mm. how you have to look after a border collie. I tell them if they've got several dogs not to throw balls together because they start to collide and yeah. herd each other and <laughs> etc. and then you get trouble. Yeah. Not to over-exercise as a puppy because their, their shoulders and their hips need to form, but they need very good socialization He's just six months, and I tend to keep him out so that he can get used to people, used to going up the road, mm. all those sort of things. And they can start teaching them basic obedience right from when they have them, really. And now we need to find out who'll join the Bowmastiff later on in Best in Show. Once again, Terry Munro judges the pastoral group. Mr Munro is now looking at the Australian cattle dog. The Australian cattle dog, number double one, two, one. The Australian shepherd. The Australian shepherd, number double one, double four. The bearded collie. Breed today was judged by Donald Moore. The bearded collie, number one, two, oh, eight. And now we come to the first of our Belgian shepherd dogs. This the Grunendal. The Grunendal number 1340. And now we have the Malinois. Sorry, they're out of order on our list. It looks like a Lacanois to me. <laughs> and now we have the Malinois number 1353. The Tafuran. 
and entry of 42 dogs for Kim Brown, the Tavuran number 1372, the Beauceron number 2451. The Border Collie, number 1420. The Briard, Brie today, judged by Linda Coleman. The Briard, number 1575. Jane Paradise was the Brie judge for the Catalan Sheepdogs. The Catalan Sheepdog, number 1582. The Rough Collie, judged by John Basing. The Rough Collie, number 1602. The Smooth Collie, from an entry of 37 dogs. The Smooth Collie, number 1691. The Estrella Mountain Dog. The breed today was judged by Sheila Munro. The Finnish Lapland, judged by Carol Stuckey. The Finnish Lapland, number 1771. Now we have the Hungarian Puli. The Hungarian Puli, number 1875. The Commodore, another breed today for Liz Cartledge. The Commodore, number 1894. On the table now is the Lancashire Healer. The Lancashire Healer, number 1915. Mr. Munro is now looking at the Marema Sheepdog, another breed today for Pamela Jeans Brown. The Norwegian Bullhund, number 1955. The Old English Sheepdog, number 1991. The Polish Lowland Sheepdog, number 2024. The Pyrenean Mountain Dog, number 2063. The long-haired Pyrenean Sheepdog, judged by Mike Cafferata. The long-haired Pyrenean Sheepdog, number 2081. The Samoyed, number 2133. Now is the Shetland Sheepdog. The breed today was judged by Sandra Taylor. The Shetland Sheepdog, number 2266. The Swedish Falhun, number 2301. The Turkish Tangle Dog. Breed judge was Juliet Lester Hope. The Turkish Tangle Dog, number 2323. The Cardigan Welsh Corgi. Karen Hewitt sent through this dog number 2327 as her best of breed. The final dog in this, the pastoral group, the Pembroke Welsh Corgi. The Pembroke Welsh Corgi number 2424. Mr. Munro has had a final look at all these dogs in the group and will now decide on a short list. If uh, the new chairman was sat in the audience tonight, yes. What would you ask him? To care. I see myself as the judge that was banned.
and we'll now decide on a shortlist. In comes the bearded collie, the Estrella mountain dog, the, the Finnish Lapwund, the Hungarian Puli, Norwegian Bufund, the Old English Sheepdog, and the Cardigan Welsh Corgi, also the Pembroke. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hand together for those best of breed winners leaving the ring now. Don't be shy in putting your hands together for your own favourite. And first to be moved is the Bearded Collie, number 1208. Now it's the turn of the Estrella Mountain Dog, number 1723. The Finnish Lapund, number 1771. The Hungarian Puli, number 1875. Now it's the turn of the Norwegian Buhun, number 1955. The Old English Sheepdog, number 1991. The Cardigan Welsh Corgi, number 2327. And finally, it's the turn of the Pembroke Welsh Corgi, number 2424. <coughs> the words have been called for, gentlemen. The winner of the Pastoral Group National Working and Pastoral Breed Society 2014 is the Hungarian Puli, number 1875. Into group two goes the Cardigan Welsh Gorgi. Group three, the Norwegian Buhun, 1955. And group four, the Old English Sheepdog. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the winners of the pastoral group, the Hungarian Puli. Very well done, John. Looks like you and Dougie have uh, made the journey rather worthwhile. <laughs> well, certainly have. Uh, it's been a long day, <laughs> uh, leaving at four o'clock this morning, so um, we'll probably not get home till after midnight tonight, but it's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it. How has he dealt with the temperatures today? Because it's got pretty... Uh, it's pretty warm. Earlier on it was pretty warm for the breed judging, but then I've just kept him in the shade and sprayed for the rest of the day just to keep him quite cool. Does, does the corded coat keep him even warmer? No, it actually, he's actually cool underneath. Right. He quite likes the breeze on his tongue. Tell us about Dougie. This is his 7th CC in Best of Breed. He's, um, he's won the CC at Crofts for the past two years. He won seven reserve CCs as a puppy and won his first CC as a junior. He's currently top pulley. So. Fantastic. We, we see pulleys, uh, hi doggy, they feature in the placings an awful lot, but they don't necessarily get the group win. How does it feel to, to get the group win today? Brilliant. But this, I know this judge likes pulleys, <laughs> you know, so he's always had a keen interest yeah. in it and that always helps. Tell us about the maintenance. I keep him in toggies and t-shirts right. when he's not at shows, right. just to keep him clean. And then he has a bath. And it usually takes maybe two or three hours to bath him and condition him, and then it'll maybe take a day to dry. Wow. <laughs> and as soon as he's dry, he gets the toggies back in and back up. But I mean, he's a normal dog in between times. He gets, goes out to the park, runs with other dogs, and he has a normal life. You know, they're pretty agile, wee breed, you know, and that active. They're non allergenic. So anybody that's allergic to dogs could have a pulley because it's wool and it just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. A lot of people who have pet pullies keep them corded but short right, okay. because this is, when it gets wet, it, <laughs> it stays wet. It is sort of labour of love, you know, it has to be. But the, the finished picture, I think, is amazing. In comes the winner of the working group, the Bull Mastiff, a dog, number 338. Followed by the Hungarian Puli, 1875.
Mr. Munro moving them for one more time. This, as I said before, is the winner of the working group, the Bull Mastiff, number 338. And now it's the turn of the Hungarian Puli, winner of the pastoral group, also a dog, number 1875. Boards have been called for. And best in show goes to the Bull Mastiff dog, number 338. And reserve best in show to the Hungarian Puli dog, number 1875. Round you go. Best in show and reserve best in show, National Working and Pastoral Breeds 2014. Well, congratulations, Peter. You gave Matt half an hour's breather. He goes back in and takes best in show. How do you feel? Oh, absolutely overwhelmed by it all. It's a phenomenal success for Bull Mastiffs to achieve this level. Is it's so unusual, but so, so great at the same time. Yeah. It's when when you see Bull Mastiffs win groups, it's often here and there. But there's, has there ever been this level of consistency with the breed? Not that I can think of for a number of years. Um, we've had the odd success here and there, but for Mac, the way he's, you know, it's four groups he's had this year in seven months. It's, you know, normally if you can get one <laughs> every five years, you're doing well. And, so it's and you're up against, for top working certainly, at the moment, Bart, the Alaskan Malamute. Must be great to have you both in the lineup and you coming out top. Yeah, yeah, we've competed several times, and, um, you know, Sh Shoes Dog is a lovely dog. Um, so, you know, to actually go one better and beat them is phenomenal for us because you can appreciate all the good dogs. And it must be very special today, it being a working pastoral specialist show. Yeah, because these shows tend to bring in the most knowledgeable judges, so to win under them who, who really understand the breeds yeah. is, is, is great for us. Well, thank you very much, Terry, for joining us. It's a pleasure. How have you enjoyed your judging today? Very much. Um, it's always a nice experience to judge a national working breeze, especially when the weather's right. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little hot earlier, but it cooled down towards the group tonight. It was, yeah, but overall I thought they managed pretty well. Yeah. I think I did as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about your, your Bull Mastiff Best in Show winner in a minute. Take us down your line. The Alaskan Malamute was second. Yeah, the Alaskan Malamute, good sized dog, plenty of bone, quite a handful at that age. The third in the group was the, the Portuguese wasp dog. Lovely movement, and you can see everything that's there. Yeah. An easy dog to judge. The dog de Bordeaux, very powerful, very strong, yet it can move so lightly. It's quite a surprising dog. And taking us to the pastoral group, the, the Hungarian Puli finished up reserve best in joke, and then take us down your lineup there as well. Hungarian Puli, good head shape, character, moved very lightly across the ring. Mm. Cardigan Corgi is well known. Again, movement, good factor. He stood out very well. And then next was the probably the most best supported dog in the group was the, the Boo Hunt. Boo Hunt, yes. Surprising, aren't they? Yeah. Lovely head and ears and sound as a bell. And Old English Sheepdog in fourth? I didn't know the handler, I didn't know the dog. Slightly longer than I would like, but lovely head and very sound movement again. Um, and then finally, we come back in for best in show. Bull Mastiff yeah. Mac, tell us what you thought of him. I thought he was smashing. <laughs> lovely head. So well muscled and so sound when he moved out, really fantastic. Yeah. And he looks so athletic for a big dog as well. He does, yes, he's really nice, outstanding. Yeah. An easy decision, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Terry. Well, we've timed it just about perfectly. The rain, as you can see, is now coming down. Thank you very much for watching. Congratulations to Mac, the Bull Mastiff, and we'll see you next time on Around the Dog World at City of Birmingham Championship Dog Show.